Good afternoon. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Um, calling order here. So, um, members, officers, and any members of the public, um, you're viewing the live stream of this meeting, and welcome also to those in the room. Um, my name is Councillor Jeff Harvey, um, and this afternoon I will be chairing this committee. Um, and I'm standing in for Pippa Halings, who's been quite unwell this last week, and uh, I'm sure the committee would like to send um, their wishes for her speedy recovery. Um, so, um, for the information of members of the public, our committee advisors, and cabinet on actions required to achieve the Council's target on climate change and its environmental commit, um, commitments, um, that's the purpose of this committee. Um, Please can those present in the council chamber note that um, everything on your desk might be visible if you speak because the camera will track to your desk. Um, if you're participating um, via the live stream, um, would you please use the chat function to indicate that you would like to speak and um, please don't use the chat for any other purpose. Uh, please make sure your device is fully charged. Um, if you wish to speak, uh, switch on your microphone first, obviously, and then switch it off uh, immediately afterwards. Um, please use a headset if you have one so that we can hear you more clearly. Um, and uh, when you've finished speaking, um, you will uh, switch the microphone off and we can continue the meeting. Um, do we have any apologies for absence? Chair, I'll use your microphone to apologize. Yes, Chair, we have apologies from Councillor de Bailings, Grenville Chamberlain, and Graham Cohn. Although she's not a member of the committee, uh, Leader Bridget Smith, uh, who is the portfolio lead camera member responsible for climate and environment, has also sent her apologies. Councillor Mark Howell is subbing for Councillor Graham Cohn, and Councillor Sue Ellington is subbing for. Councillor Grenville Chamberlain. Thank you, Patrick. Um, do you, any members have any interest to declare in relation to any item on the agenda? Good. And if, if anything subsequently becomes apparent, um, perhaps you would uh, let us know and raise it at that point. Um, so moving on to minutes from previous meetings, I think we have two sets of minutes to review here. So we have the minutes from the Climate Environment Advisory Committee held on the 13th of September um, this year. Um, perhaps I could just run through the pages and if anyone has anything to comment. Um, anything on page one of the agenda pack? Um, um, page two, page two, page three, page three, page four. Okay. Yes, I just wondered if um, something was missing um, under converting taxis to electric vehicles because there's a kind of partial, partial word of partial sentence there. Um, which page and paragraph? Sorry, that was on page three, under converting taxis to electric vehicles. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Bear Park. Um, I had a message from um, our Environment Officer Siobhan Mellon, um, and I think it might be the end of this. Or, or at the end of this meeting that um, we requested an update on the Green Homes Grant local authority delivery. Is, are you there, Siobhan? And I wonder where the best place for you to give that update might be. Uh, matter, matters arising from the minutes, I would suggest. Okay. So shall we... I mean, we'll review the second set of meeting, uh, meeting minutes and then come back to that. So uh, on page five, this is a very... Um, short follow-on meeting from the scrutiny and overview, which is quite an extended review of the um, first proposal 
consultation document on the local plan. Um, and the reason these minutes are so short is it was very late in the evening and actually all of the members who were present at Climate Environment Committee had also been present for the earlier session at scrutiny. Um, so many of the comments that we would have had were uh, given at the scrutiny open, overview committee. But um, do we have any um, comments on these minutes? Page, page five, page six. Okay, we'll take that as being a correct record of that meeting. Um, so, um, Siobhan, could we now return then um, matters arising from the first set of minutes? Yes, so thank you, Councillor Harvey. Um, this is just Further to uh, the item on the 13th of September on energy efficiency, um, the chair asked to be updated on developments with the Green Homes Grant LAD schemes, local authority delivery schemes. And so just to update that there have been three phases of these schemes. And for the first and third of these, we have been part of city-led Cambridgeshire consortium bids for funding to the government. We're awaiting to hear news of the third of those. Um, and meanwhile, starting the process of setting up a Cambridgeshire service to deliver this funding. Uh, we were successful in securing funding through the first phase and our original plans to focus on park homes have not, however, proved possible. Uh, delays, uh, which were knock on delays caused by delays to an, an, an earlier phase, took us into a new national standards regime, which made the original plans unfeasible. However, we are looking into alternative ways to use the funding allocated in phase one. Funding has also been allocated for South Cambridgeshire under the second phase, LAD2, and we're hoping to use this work, uh, this for work to our council properties. Unlike phases one and three, which are being managed by the city-led Cambridgeshire Consortium, the delivery of phase two is being managed by the Greater South East Energy Hub. Uh, so that that's that's the uh, the, 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 the brief update to, the, uh, to where we're at with the three phases of the scheme so far. Thank you very much for that update. Um, so now I think, take that as um, the matters arising from the minutes, we can move on to uh, agenda item five, which is um, public questions. And we have received a question from Elizabeth McWilliams, um, as laid out in the agenda on the first page. Um, is Elizabeth McWilliams here to, I guess I can see you on the screen. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think you have um, three minutes initially um, to ask your question, and then if a subsequent question should arise, then one minute for that, so thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for allowing me to ask a question today. Um, I note from the minutes of um, the May meeting of this committee that uh, Councillor Gavin Clayton asked whether any of the plastic recycling collected by South Cam's residents was sent abroad and burned. In response to that, Councillor Neil Goff replied that to the best of his knowledge, all the plastic recycled from the district was treated in the UK. Um, I wanted to look into this a bit further to be assured since um, Councillor Goff's response was a little bit vague there. Um, and I note that the South Cam's website directs me to the um, the, uh, the DEFRA National Waste Data Flow website, which is incredibly difficult to use. Um, I did find a, um, a, a sort of guidance uh, sheet to help me. But all the queries I tried to run on it, uh, looking at data for South Cams, came up with zero percent. So just a bit of background. I'll now go into my slightly long question, which I'm going to read out. I hope that's all right. So um, what happens to the plastics we put in our blue bins? I note that the South Cams website states over 97 percent of the recyclable plastic that Greater Cambridge Shared Waste Service collects is sent to UK reprocessors for recycling. The remaining material which is exported is fully tracked in accordance with strict guidelines from DEFRA, and this is recorded on the National Waste Data Flow website. Materials are only sent to sites which have a permit to recycle them legally. So specifically, one, 
What monitoring is in place of the AMI contract to ensure that the 97% target reprocessed in the UK is met? Two, what percent UK reprocessed has been achieved so far in 21 to 22? Three, what was the percent UK reprocessed in 20 to 21? Is the trend improving or not? And lastly, how does the tracking of the remaining material work? As explained, I've tried generating reports from the National Waste Data Flow website on recycling and landfill, and this returns 0% for South Cams. Could you therefore please clarify what percent of waste is sent abroad for processing and to which countries? Thanks very much. Yes, um, thank you very much for that question. I understand that our officer Rebecca, Rebecca Weymouth-Wood is, um, is there to uh, answer the question for us. Thank you. Hi. Um, so yes, uh, by way of a response to all of those things, um, so, um, so just a point of clarification for you really, so there's no specification within our contract um, with our reprocessor about how much should be recycled in the UK, but we do um, obviously encourage them to do um, do that and use UK destinations as much as possible. So the 97% that was referenced um, is um, how much uh, plastic was recycled in the UK in, it's actually 19, uh, 20, 19, 2020, so it's a bit of an old figure, so I can obviously give you the latest figures on that. So uh, that was how much plastic was recycled in the, in the UK in that year. Um, and also just to reassure you about the monitoring of, of the contract, um, Within our contract, you know, we do stipulate that we get really regular reports from them, um, breaking down the composition of the waste and all the destinations. It's a mandatory requirement that, that the contractor provide that to us. So then we can then do our waste data flow returns. Um, and in addition to that, we also employ a contract monitoring officer. Um, and he um, not only looks at all the data that the contractor provides, but he also goes physically to site to see what's going on. So we've do we've done that employed that person deliberately to have that oversight of the contract. Um, so in terms of um, what percentage of um, was processed in, in the UK I mean, so far this year, well, I can clarify actually in 2021, um, only 0.5% of the plastics went abroad for recycling, all the rest of it was processed within the UK. Um, and in terms of tracking that through to this year to date, actually none, none of our plastics has gone aboard for recycling. It's all recycled in the UK. So there is, as you say, an improving trend, um, as you would hope to see. Um, so that's the case there. Um, and, um, it, and indeed, overall, the majority of the recycling is, is processed in the UK, as Councillor Goff was re referring to. Um, and um, yeah, so a, our contractor is doing a good job in terms of sourcing UK markets. Um, the reason why you couldn't uh, actually find what you needed to find on waste data flow is um, when we uh, when we became a shared service, uh, waste data flow, the organisation that runs that site, had to pick a council, and actually all our figures are under Cambridge City Council at the minute. <laughs> so we can obviously speak to them to get that changed. So that just you know is a simple uh, explanation of you know labelling, and that's probably why it was a bit confusing. So um, yes. Um, does that does that help answer that question? Yes, it does. Thanks for explaining that. Particularly helpful regarding the waste data flow website. I might have another play with it and just satisfy myself that the figures do come up. Then, if, in that case, if that's yes. the case. Um, so, just I guess my 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 question as a um, as sort of arising from that response. Um, is um, so that 0.5% that's going abroad, um, do we know what happens to it? And, and if I, I mean, in terms of uh, whether it is burnt or whether there is, you know, you don't, you won't know that. Well, we know where it's, we know the companies that it's sent to and actually that point it was actually in Germany and the Netherlands, um, you know, it, it, uh, and they, you know, they would have been sent to a plastic reprocessor in that company, you know. Okay. Okay. So I, I just would like to hope that um, in in future there can perhaps be a little bit more put into the contract about levels that hoped for. 
Um, I don't know if that's possible or not, rather than because, you know, this with the 97 percent figure being based on a, a national figure rather than a sort of a commitment, you know, a, a specific mm. commitment. It would be nice to see a specific commitment that South Cams could um, you could commit to, <laughs> to put it uh, not particularly clearly. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, well, thank you, Elizabeth, for um, thank you. just keeping this very important um, matter in uh, the front of our mind. Um, and you said, well, that's one side of the coin. I suppose the other is um, using less pl plastic. And I, I was very interested in the um, feature we had in the South Cams magazine last time on um, refill shops. And uh, happy to say that um, the Harvey family now wash their hair with shampoo from a Coke bottle. So um, uh, I think that's... Uh, that's another way of looking at it. But um, thank you very much. Anyway, oh, uh, sorry. I have a um, yes. Mark, uh, Councillor Mark Howell would would like. To... Thank you, Chairman. Just to ask if the information that's just been given can be made available to the questioner and also to the members of this committee. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, perhaps now we could move on to. Agenda item six, which is um, the report on a um, very important piece of work, I think the stock modelling. I'm report. so sorry, Chairman. Um, I do apologise for interrupting you. Just above six, there's a request to speak. Is that not happening now? Oh, um, so, sorry, I thought you had spoken. I, I'm very, very sorry. Oh, no, 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 not me. Uh, it says here there's a request to speak from a Mr. F Daniel Fulton about the I'm just wondering if that's happening. Oh, okay. Um, yes, no, um, I should have covered that. Um, so Daniel Fulton, I, I understand, um, withdrew his request to speak because he'd actually had a conversation with our chair, um, Pippa Halings, um, uh, at some point last week and, and felt that he, thank you, he no longer needed to bring that point. So, yes, thank you. Um, and, uh, thank you for reminding me that that was on the agenda, um, Councillor Howells. Um, so yes, moving back on to agenda item six, um, I say a very important piece of work, um, modeling uh, how we can reduce the carbon emissions from, from our stock. Um, and we have, I think is it um, Eddie Spicer will uh, yes. present the report for us. Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks Councillor Harvey. Um, yeah, I'll, um, I've actually take, taken over from this from Jeff. Of, of I came back to South Cairns um, about six weeks ago, so I'm kind of picking up on the work that uh, Jeff has started and following it through. I'll be looking after the project from from here on. Um, so as 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 an overview, um, we've we've been looking at uh, all all of the properties and uh, where we are and what we can do as far as. Um, reducing our sort of carbon, etc. Um, a lot of the, um, I suppose what you could call the quick win works, if you like, have already been completed, uh, where we've, we've got sort of properties where we know that we would um, achieve good elements in external wall insulation and the heat pumps and so on. Um, so the sort of the, the, the easier win stuff has already been completed over the last probably five years. Um, where we are at the moment is the more difficult retrofit um, properties where um, various technologies and so on may or may not fit and we may have um, issues with the, the property archetypes and things like that. Um, so I mean, as, as, you'll, as you'll see in the report, there's a graph in there which gives an overview of where we are on our set bandings at the moment. Um, and we're so sort of pre pretty good. The average is a C, so it's it's, it's pretty good. We've got an average rating of seventy-seven point six seven. So I, overall, it's pretty good. Um, I am starting to concentrate on. We've got a few properties which are still in the E, e F, and G um, categories, which which will start to work a bit closer on uh, when it comes to uh, getting a bit bit closer to the work. Um, we've, we've got uh, the five-year um, capital program already in place which is going to cover a lot of the items that we would be looking at anyway. Um, the current state of play is we've, we've got um, a full stock um, analysis from Savills uh, which they, they produced a report for us 
um, late 19, early 20, um, which gives us a, um, a bit of an overview of the properties, what, what possibilities there are. Um, but what we're um, sort of trying to concentrate on really is the the right kind of um, retrofit um, answers um, rather than just sort of uh, going forward with um, the, the sort of standard stuff which may or may not fit the property. We need the, the properties that we need to be working on really need to have a, a, a good bespoke element um, to make them make them viable and make some good returns on them. Uh, we've been working with a company called Liberty, um, which is named the Net Zero uh, Collect or CO2 Collective. And basically, what, we've got five properties that we've um, given to them. They're, they're monitoring um, any pre improvement uh, statistics within the property um, as far as uh, sort of heat, humidity, how the property is used, all that kind of thing. They've given us um, some proposals which are in the appendix, um, which which follow, um, which in in all honesty is nothing sort of um, groundbreaking, um, but we are looking at what they have um, suggested and how that would fit with the properties and uh, the residents and what effect we may have from those on things like fuel poverty and so on. Um, we we have had issues um, with obviously with fuel poverty in, in the area and that's creeping up. I think 2019, I think locally it was at about 10% and I think we're, we're up to about 13% fuel poverty on the households at the moment. And that's, I feel that's only going to increase with the increase in energy costs and so on. So, with, with that in mind as well, we need to sort of take a, a good approach to what we do um, with the rest of the properties to make sure that not only do we reduce their carbon, but we also make it um, truly affordable for, for the residents um, that we actually have. Um, I mean, even um, on, on the basics like air, air source heat pumps, for example, the it sounds re really, really nice as a good uh, a good solution, but there's still the the element of electric that needs to go in it, and the, the obviously the, the the more expensive the electric is going in, um, the the less cost effective it becomes for the resident, even though it does reduce carbon um, quite considerably. Um, so we are looking at the moment with with um, Liberty and the uh, net zero to. Um, look at installing um, some or all of the proposals that uh, have been made. There's a couple that we are negotiating just at the moment. And they were looking potentially at uh, sort of in, in the early new year, uh, January, February time to hopefully um, get those underway. We are having great problems within the sector and the um, sort of the, the water areas with, with um resource and getting the actual materials so things like air source heat pumps and so on they're very very difficult to get hold of at the moment so the, the time span of actually installing may may extend a little bit depending on on where we are um, as far as that goes um so i think that that, that covers most things um i'm like to say in in the um reports that we got back from uh the net zero lot so there was nothing really um groundbreaking on there most of it is extra insulation um air source heat pumps on a lot of things and uh battery storage if there's already pv on the roof or or adding pv if there wasn't and so on so there's there's some there's some good solutions there um it we just need to enter some dis further discussions with the residents now to um, ensure that they're sort of on board and happy with the proposals and the potential outcomes of uh, what we're intending to do. Um, so that that's basically where we are currently. Um, obviously, uh, like, like I said at the beginning, I've, I've only just taken over, um, and I'm looking at this this um, project taking off, uh, like I say, early in the new year. But in the in the meantime, the properties where we've got the um, the lower sap rates, I'll be looking at those um, 
in great detail to find out what options we have. And um, I do know that a number of the properties we haven't been able to access um, because the residents are elderly or something and don't want um, any upheaval or anything within the property. So that poses obviously a, it, its own problems. Um, but yeah, what we're looking at with over the next um, couple of years to get all of the uh, detail right and the um, up and coming technologies that are out there at the moment, which are um, some are in the early stages and quite expensive. But as as things develop, it will um, there, there will be a sort of good solutions out there on top of what we already have. And it's it's about making the right decisions and the best value for um, for the council and for the, for the residents themselves. Um, I think that will cover it, I believe, unless there's anything else anyone wants to know. Well, um, thank you, Eddie, for that update. Um, do you, any members of the committee have, have questions? Yes. Um, Councillor? Councillor Ellington. Thank you. Um, I've I may have missed something, but we're talking here about ninety two million pounds or one hundred and seventy five point six million pounds over thirty years. How many houses are we actually talking about there? i I see the EFGs amount to sixty eight or something like that, and it, that can't relate to that. So I'm looking at, are we talking about the whole housing stock, even those who have quite a good um, rating being included in that number? And for the next point I wanted to raise, if I may, um, is um, what is the actual problem with those residents who are refusing to have the um, uh, insulation and improvements done to their properties, why would anybody object as long as they don't have to pay for it? Okay, I'll, I'll take on the second point first, if I may. Um, what, what we find sometimes with um, some of the residents, particularly the um, the more elderly residents, they, they may have um, people in the, in the household who are um, sort of entering palliative care almost and things like that, or um, they're in the, the sort of the later stages of life and have very in, sort of intensive care needs and so on. They, they just don't want any disruption uh, within their property. Um, that, that, that's, that's, that's quite common in a, in a lot of places where um, where the, the residents are at, of a certain age, shall we say. Um, it's, it's understandable because obviously they're, they're having certain works done at the property can be um, quite disruptive. Um, I mean, even, even sort of basic things like kitchens can absolutely turn your life upside down for a, a number of weeks. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite understandable. Um, there are some other properties where um, people just don't don't want improvements. Um, there's, they may have various reasons for it, personal reasons, and we do try and engage as much as we can. Uh, but ultimately, if if they say they don't want it, we can't we can't force them um, at the moment. So that. I hope that covers um, what you what you wanted to know on that one. Um, and as for the costings, um, the, this, the the actual report was created by Jeff, so I'm I'm, I'm only picking up on what he's already um, put together. Uh, but from what I understand within the report, it is on all the, all of the properties within our stock, um, concentrating on the, the lower rated first. Um, and even the ones that are at the higher end um, of of the scale have got potential to be better. So obviously in a priority way, once we've dealt with the worst performing, we can then move on to those that are better performing and make them even better than they are now. Okay, 
Does that answer your question, Councillor Ellington? Yes. Good. Um, thank, you. Well, thank you for that, um, Eddie. Um, I've got a question now from Councillor Howell. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so I think you've answered the first part of my question, which is basically that um, everybody, every tenant can choose whether or not to have anything done to their house. And if for any reason they don't want to, they don't have to go forward with it at this moment in time. Uh, that, that's, my, that's the correct understanding from what you've just answered? Yes, we don't, we, we, we don't, we don't force people to have anything um, where they are safety issues or compliance issues. Then obviously we would, we would push as far as we um, possibly could to, to get those done. Um, but where it's a, a home improvement, um, where there is disruption to it, they do have the right to um, decline. Um, solar panels and also the external cladding as well as the loft installation. We access several grants that were then available to us from the government, but also the fact with regards to solar panels we use an external company to fund it because they then could get a particular revenue stream. Are we still exploring all those options? Um, yes. Um, I mean, as I should mentioned earlier on, there is um, the the lead two element, which we're currently looking at, which could co contribute towards it. Um, and we're looking at any other um, avenues of funding that are available. Um, there are some um, partnership working options, like you say, with the um, the solar from a few years ago. Um, that's not not um, as buoyant as it was because the returns for companies aren't anywhere close to where they were. So there's there's not quite so much of that available. Um, but yeah, we are looking at um, any possible options um, where funding can be sought um, or other, other types of partnership um, can be sort of brought, brought in and uh, where we could possibly help. Um, some of the um, consultants um, that we're, we're using, we're looking at sort of um, potential sort of guarantee numbers, whether that will be something that can be guaranteed or not is... is um, is a, an, another matter, but it's, if they say we're going to have, say, 10% savings, then the aim would be that in a number of years' time, there would be 10% savings. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's they're very much in the early days, but uh, there, there is a hope that we can explore as many um, avenues as possible. Um, I have a, a question, um, if I may, um, uh, on the same um, paragraph, the report really, um, which is paragraph 12 on page 9. Um, and I just wondered if you could explain, well firstly, um, I think that the, the, the initial figure mentioned is an average cost of £30,000 per house, but then you, you say that um, that will actually be uh, more like £17,000 per dwelling. Um, and and I, I guess it's it, have I sort of understood correctly that the difference there is because some of the things that you would be doing in terms of a retrofit um, would actually stand in place of maintenance that you would otherwise have had to, do, to have done anyway? No, no. Within, within, um, within the next 30-year plan, um, we will have things within um, that plan such as um, replacement windows, replacement roofs, those kind of things. Um, which which would be um, within the capital expense for the for the property anyway, um, and if if for instance within the um, figures for getting net zero of the thirty thousand per property, you could say well five thousand that is already allocated in a thirty year plan for uh, new windows and doors, um, so it's it's already allocated. So if, even if we didn't do anything in re in relation to uh, net zero, we would still be spending um, sort of 15,000 per property on the other um, replacements or upgrades that we would do as, as standard throughout our stock anyway. I so I, if I understand then what you're saying is that, for example, um, we might have had to have replaced the gas boiler at some point, but instead we've 
the kind of some of that cost would actually go to the air source heat pump. Um, so. Yes, yeah, you, yeah, you could you could equate it to that, and where we're not like say with like windows and doors is a prime example. Um, at some point, we would be replacing windows and doors because they would expire their, their lifetime. Um, the new products going in um, are much better efficiency when they're putting in triple glazed, and the, the, the values are far far better on the, the new technologies that we're putting in. Thank you, and and just on the, the sums themselves. I'll, are they sort of in today's money, if you like? I mean, for example, is is 175 million? Um, does that take into account that you know you could have taken that money and invested it somewhere and got a return on that, and therefore, you know, it's, it's today's money rather than a sort of discounted cash flow sort of sum? Um, as I understand it, the, the value would would equate to sort of today's value price wise um but the, the the sums are based over a 30 year period um not sure who were you first um council bear park um, okay you, you haven't had a chance yet so i'll come back to councillor how after your question um yes my um comment really is about um energy price rises and the rise in the price cap so we've had a recent rise in the price cap we're likely to have a price cap, which will an increase in the price cap, which will rise probably by several hundred pounds next year, which for some of our residents, I should think is going to be quite a frightening prospect. Um, I suppose my question is really about how we prioritize the work um, so that those in, you know, likely to be in fuel poverty or pushed into fuel poverty um, are prioritized and how you, how you go about prioritizing how the work is done. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, 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 the most difficult part of fuel poverty is identifying a household that has fuel poverty. Um, I, a few years ago, I, I, I did a, um, a course and a study in regards to this, and it was quite aware nationally that trying to identify the any household that is in fuel poverty is incredibly difficult because no no one wants to admit to being in fuel poverty. How it's calculated is um, it, it's quite difficult to work out within your your your, your overall um, household income. Um, so it's it's very difficult to determine from um, from from our point of view. We could try and identify a bit better through sort of our, our surveys and so on which are coming out but even even then you're only getting what people actually want to tell you which is it's, it's very difficult so the, the the only real way that we can um make it work for the for, for real benefit is to start with those lowest performing properties and make them better and work work through it um and work work through the the, the stock on a um on a performance basis. Um, if it is highlighted at all, which it, it does occasionally get highlighted to us, um, either through the su support networks or um, other sort of other avenues like members of family or so on that people are struggling, then we, we do look at those. We do try and support them um, as much as we can and do what we can for the, the property. And if, it, if, if something like that was highlighted, we could, um, look at prioritizing it but it is like i say it's a very 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 difficult um one to answer if i'm honest thank you uh councillor howell i think you were first thank you chairman um just a quickie i i think however i'm asking this question and it should be to mr madico um to the portfolio holder councillor bachelor with regards to the debt we have um, has that been raised, the housing debt we've got to be raised, and therefore could we finance it from that, or are we going to use the HRA revenue? And um, if we can raise on the um, housing debt, could we use that and therefore make um, these efficiencies far quicker? I'd say it might be for more from uh, Mr. Maddock and Mr. Bachelor, uh, Councillor Bachelor. Yes, yeah, unfortunately that one I, I won't be able to answer.
equipment is going to be installed in your average council house kitchen, there isn't going to be much room for anybody else. I just wondered whether you're using a different sort of heat pump, air pump, than I have. Uh, and and what, how big they are, and, and whether that is one of the things that is stopping residents from wanting to have this change. Thank you, Councillor Angton. Um, do, do you have a view on that, um, Eddie? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that is um, obviously a con consideration to um, heat pumps. They they are um, they they, are, they do involve more equipment um, internally. Um, there shouldn't really be a huge amount of difference um, internally. The I mean, yeah, the hot water tank will be larger because because it needs to um, store. Uh, water in a different way, and sort of the the volumes need to be there for the for the temperature. Um, they're also uh, pressurised as well, so they will be bigger than a a standard standard tank. Um, the internal um, boiler relevance of the, the heat exchanging parts on there shouldn't be hugely different to um, a standard water boiler or something. Um, but in some cases, they 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 will be, and then obviously you've got the external parts which the actual um the heat pump itself which sits, sits outside with a big fan unit on it um i mean they, they yes they are um some potential downsides that people um don't like or don't want um but at the at this moment in time options for um alternative heating are quite limited uh, if we're completely honest it's you're almost down to either sort of storage heaters, which people in general don't really like, um, and air source heat pumps, which they are very much a, I suppose, a marmite type of the piece of equipment. Some people absolutely love them, and other people hate them, but they are very, very much based on how they're used, and if if they're not used ex sort of exactly as they're intended then they, they can be potentially less efficient and people will um, have a, a poor opinion of them. And it's, it's, it's very much based on, on the person um, and, and the property. Thank you. Do we have other? Um, Councillor yes. Khan, thank you. Um, if you're installing, you would no doubt be installing further solar panel systems and various uh, proposals. Um, your previous uh, solar panels were installed using a, a separate company and they used a feed-in tariff. Now the feed-in tariff has stopped um, and the, uh, the system is you, the system now is that they, you get paid for what you produce and you, uh, and you export and you, so, uh, and otherwise you just uh, pay what balance that you use from the mains. How would that work if the county installed it? Would uh, something the, the district installed it? Would we be um, a, a benefit, benefiting from the sales of electricity? Uh, would it all pass to the tenant? Would the tenant take charge of it? How would you manage that in, a, in, in, in under the new system? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it very much depends on how we approach um, the solar panel um, situation. Um, as, as you rightly say, the, 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 the feed-in tariffs is, is very, very um, non-beneficial, if you like. Um, but yeah, there, there, there are a number of options. It just depends on uh, sort of what one works out the best for us. But whichever way we go, um, the savings on the, the electric generation for the residents of the property, you will be getting the, those savings anyway, because you'll be getting those um input uh, on what's actually generated thank you um okay um can i just um allow um peter campbell to come in and, and, and make a few comments um if you'd like to peter thank you chair the main thing i did just want to uh, uh, uh remind members that we've, um, as well as this report, we've also got a much more detailed asset management strategy 
um, which uh, will be coming to members in a month or two's time. Uh, a lot of the uh, issues that have been addressed with Eddie today are covered in quite some detail within that strategy. Um, so if, members will have chance to go through that in quite some depth uh, once that reaches you. So that was um, there is a workshop uh, next week, I believe, with um, uh, members and tenants with a view to um, say going to um, uh, back to SEAC uh, and to uh, uh, Cabinet uh, uh, later on. So some of the issues, especially, and one thing to bear in mind is that one of the, the big things that we're suggesting is that we need to carry out a, a, a full stock condition survey uh, of, of every property. At the moment, what we're putting forward is a situation as we know it. Once we have a stock condition survey, we'll be able to have much more um, detail of what the starting point is for 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 this great uh, for this move forward, and we'll be able to work out much more details, um, uh, detailed costings and plans, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Peter Campbell. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions. I, I have a few questions myself on the uh, net zero report attached as um, appendices to the main report. Um, and firstly, yep. um, you know, I think it's just wonderful that we've actually got some hard data here. And um, it obviously is the right way to go about this, to kind of gather some data. We've, we've had, you know, um, temperature measurement logging and humidity logging in some houses for a period of um, is, is it maybe six months or a year to see what the energy consumption was um, prior to upgrades? And then we are making projections on that um, for the kind of savings that we could make um, with the um, modifications proposed. And this could be, um, most basic would be extra loft insulation or checking that it's, uh, the loft insulation is still um, continuous in the loft space, um, air source heat pumps, upgraded radiators and, and battery storage. Um, and actually, well, maybe this could be confirmed. I, I mean, the most amazing thing perhaps is that on one of the two um, test properties, um, we're quoting 125% reduction of CO2 against um, current building performance. So I assume that that means that we are um, in a sort of CO2 surplus, if you like. In other words, the um, year-round energy generation from the PV is now greater than the amount of energy that we consume in keeping the house at that temperature, which, which, I, which I think is wonderful because that, if that is the case, then uh, we're using our housing stock to offset some of the carbon dioxide emissions in, in the wider uh, South Cams area. Um, I just wondered, um, it, it didn't say in the report what the assumptions were on the um, carbon dioxide intensity of grid electricity. Um, and I thought that was perhaps an omission because uh, clearly that would have a bearing on, uh, especially if you've got electric heating, uh, we need to know what the uh, carbon intensity of grid, grid electricity is in order to say uh, what the CO2 saving might be. So um, I'm not sure whether you have um, an answer on that. Um, second point, um, rolling all these into one, I was quite surprised actually at the quite high temperature that the residents in these two test cases uh, ran their houses at. And I wondered whether you thought that was because they actually wanted to live in a house that's 25 degrees, which I, I, I would find much, much too hot. Um, or is that kind of typical, do you think? Or is, is that actually as a result of the problems with controlling the temperature with um, storage heaters? Uh, so two questions, Aaron. Apologies for that. Okay. Um, yeah, from, from what I understand on these reports, um, it is purely on the, the property themselves and um, the, electric, the electricity generation carbon elements, I don't think, are um, within um what's what's scoped in the in the report um it is one of the things that uh i've got on to discuss with them at uh, at the next meeting is various um elements that 
aren't mentioned within the within this current report. So um, there are there are some things which, which do need clarifying, and that obviously will be one of them. As far as the residents um, and their um, lifestyles and temperatures that they um, like to live in, um, what what I found um, a few years ago, where I was doing a lot of heating upgrades um, previously with, with um, South Camps, the again we're looking at uh, primarily um, on the the, the older um, demographic of our, of our residents. If they've got um, some issues where they've uh, maybe got arthritis or um, very limited movement and so on. Um, particularly with storage heaters, the way that uh, the older storage heaters um, used to produce heat where it was it used to sit very high in the room, whereas the new ones um, actually sort of the fan assisted so it starts at the bottom of the room and, and going up. So if those those that are sort of bound to a chair for most of the day, um, they they need that level of heat to keep the whole room at an ambient temperature so that they, they feel comfortable. Um, there, there's been a number of properties I've, I've gone into sort of in midwinter and yeah, like you say, it just couldn't couldn't bear it. But that's how they like to have it because of their um, their, their circumstances. And uh, it's yeah, we, we, we've gone down the route of discussing it with them and trying various different um, temperature settings for different uh, residents and yeah, it, it, all, it all comes back to the, the, the ones with particular issues want the temperatures at around the 25 degree mark uh, for just purely for comfort. Um, well, are there any more? Yes, we can pass upon you have another question. Um, I recently came across uh, replaced uh, thermostats on my radiators, uh, a couple of my radiators, and uh, I, uh, when one of them was broken, um, uh, and came, came to realize that my other thermostats had not been working for years. And then I looked up about them, and I found that the average life of a thermostat on a radiated thermostat is about eight or nine years. It should be replaced uh, relatively frequently. Now, that strikes me as something which could easily cause uh, significant problems with heat uh, management if we're not replacing on a regular basis. What's the, what's the program, program speed of replacement of radiator valves, uh, uh, thermostatic valves on radiators in, in our properties? Um, they they would generally be replaced um, either if they, if they had failed or with it, with a new system. We wouldn't, um, as a rule, be replacing them um, on on a program. Um, I mean, your 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 primary control for uh, most um, radiator driven um, heating systems is a is a, a a room or a whole house thermostat. Um, the the TRVs are generally there to restrict the level of heat in a particular room rather than balance the heat within the room. So there, for instance, with, with your bedroom, you would want um, a lower temperature to your lounge. So you would set your TRVs in your bedroom lower than you would in, the, in your lounge to restrict the temperature rather than control it. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. To a certain extent, I mean, I was reading up about how these work, and they work basically with a with a liquid which expands, uh, an oil which expands, which becomes harder with time, and therefore it ceases to work. Uh, yes. Uh, and um, if they don't work, you're going to be, if you can't balance the temperature in a particular room, you're going to be using extra, extra heat to heat that room, um, whether it's on maximum or, or minimum. And certainly it affects the ability to uh, control. It seems to me that we, uh, I don't know whether there's any research being done on this and how much um, efficiency of replacing the TRVs uh, uh, affects heat use, uh, energy use, and whether um, how much of an issue that really is. Thank you, Councillor Khan. Well, well, perhaps that's a, a something that could be looked into um, along with our other maintenance programmes, um, just to check that we don't have a problem with that. Um, do, do, do any members have any further questions on this agenda item? Otherwise, perhaps we could uh, close this now and move on to the next agenda item, um, which I think is going to be presented by Siobhan Mellon. Um, thank you, Siobhan, I see you're there. Um, the Mid-Year Progress Report on the Zero Carbon, Carbon and Doubling Nature Action Plans. 
Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> so this report, uh, as you say, presents the committee with an update on progress in delivering the zero carbon and doubling nature action plan. The action plan provides the detail on how we're working towards the targets and aspirations set in our zero carbon and doubling nature strategies. Now, so these are achieving a 45% reduction on the council's greenhouse gas emissions from our own estate and operations, excluding housing, on a 2018 to 19 baseline by 2025, helping the district halve greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, and helping the district double, double nature. So the action plan is actually revised annually, and this is the second iteration, and it's concerned primarily with actions during 2021 to 2022. And a third iteration will be developed and reported to SEAC at the start of the next financial year. And in this, we will look further ahead and include actions covering the period to 2025. So the action plan, as you'll see, is in three sections. The first lists nine actions to reduce emissions from our own estate and operations, of which one is completed. And of those still in progress, four are green, i.e. on track, and four amber, i.e. delayed, but otherwise on track. And in the next update, at the start of the new financial year, we will include information on progress towards the target of the 45% reduction. Um, the second section lists 21 actions to support the district to halve greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. 16 of these are green and five are amber. The third section lists 13 actions to support the district to double nature. There's a small mistake in the numbering, but there are actually 13 actions, not 12. Nine of these are green and four are amber. So the committee is invited to review the action plan and provide any comments. Do we have some questions for Siobhan? I had um, a question, if I may. So I suppose um, with our shared services, there's a calculation to do to apportion um, our part of the savings. For example, with shared waste, I suppose um, what we are, um, progress we're making with, with our electrified um, waste collection fleet is, is sort of partly shared both in terms of cost and, and, and the benefits with um, City. But um, and I think we've raised this before, and I wondered if we'd got any further um, with, with our ICT um, uh, power supply and um, any emissions that might be associated with that. Uh, yeah, uh, do, do you please keep pushing on this one? I have actually raised it, but I'm still still waiting for um, any information on that. But I perhaps we could um, ask Jeff Membry to to uh, uh, to pick that one that one up because um, yeah, we haven't we haven't got any information on that. The, this is the server, yeah. The um, basically the uh, the electricity from the from the IT servers. Thank you. Well, I'm sure we'll, we'll get to the bottom of that eventually, and um, just for completeness sake. So thank you very much. Um, any other questions or points? Councillor Khan. Um, looking at the doubling nature action plan, um, the target that has been set of doubling the proportion of uh, semi-natural environment within the uh, county uh, by 2050 is quite a large one. And if you look at the actual annual requirement in terms of area converted, say, from other non and natural, natural use to a semi-natural use. It, it's, 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 I think I worked out about 250 hectares a year for the whole of the county, so probably 50 for, for South Cambridge. Um, we, we know what we uh, are going to be able to provide to uh, the major developments in the, in the district um, through the major uh, uh, um, towns. Uh, how... What, how do we plan to actually convert the transfer of land <laughs> from, what, from sem, not semi-natural to semi-natural at, at that sort of rate over the period? Because I don't think that the amount of land that being proposed in the major towns will make much of an impact. It'll make a bit of an impact, but not very large. Um, 
uh, and rather than just buying up existing semi-natural land, which is what most of the, uh, the wildlife bodies do, obviously, which is, is very valuable, it's protected, but it doesn't actually increase the, uh, the capacity. How do you see the, the, the district doing that um, in view of the resources that we have, financial resources that we have available? Uh, so it, it's a very good question and not one that I'm equipped to answer. Uh, I do know that there, that part of the um, evidence base for the local plan has um, pulled together a lot of work on the opportunities um, that are uh, that that are available for improving um, natural areas. Um, and my understanding is that the, the that that work as to how that then moves into kind of delivery. Is, is still to be done, but it's not an area that I'm personally very involved in. It, um, so uh, it's perhaps something we could come back to uh, to you with further information on. Okay, thank you. Oh, so, Councillor, I think Councillor Fairpark just pitched you there, Councillor Ellington, so can we? Um, thank you, Chairman. I'd just like to say uh, thank you to Siobhan and the team for the hard work that they've been putting into progressing these actions. Very important work. Um, and I think you could be proud of what you have achieved and, and are achieving. Um, I just wanted to make a note um, regarding the Combined Authority Board, which endorsed the Climate Change Action Plan of the Independent Commission on the 28th of October. Um, I think, I believe that's going, that should be quite an ambitious programme. The Combined Authority have agreed to form a climate working group and they have to report back by the February next year. Um, and I think my comment is really, it would be, I think you mentioned, Siobhan, um, that you would be looking to um, present the um, forward-looking actions for the rest of the uh, period until 25. I think it'd be great if we could make sure that what we're doing is well aligned and is a, as ambitious as the as the as the plan that the climate working group that the combined authority are, are, are will be putting together between now and February next year. Thank you, Councillor Bear Park. Um, Councillor Ellington. Thank you. Um, I'm very concerned about uh, the tree planting and the biodiversity and so on. Um, it seems to me, um, having been a gardener most of my life, um, that quite a lot of very well-intentioned tree planting is being carried out at unsuitable times of the year. Um, with particular reference to the A14 planting of trees um, and bushes and so on on all of the flyovers and spaces down the sides of the road. I'm thinking particularly of my bit between Bar Hill, Lulworth uh, and Swavesey, where I would say 90% of those that sit in their little plastic tubes are as dead as dodos. And there appears to be no action being taken to replace or replenish those. And now is the time to plant them. And if they don't plant them now, they will be as dead as dodos next year. So it, it is about getting people to understand nature as well as getting all their good intentions. Well, thank you. That's a very valuable point, I think, and, and maybe we could um, follow up with Highways England and see what they have to say about that, if indeed they are the responsible body for those um, uh, plantings. I understand the County Council is having a little bit of a flurry, okay. according to uh, my local County Councillor. Okay, thank you, Councillor Ellington. Um, Councillor Howell, you had a Thank you, Chairman. Um, something for the future, really. Um, we have, um, many years ago in Papworth, had a bypass put round and subsequently, as 
Councillor Ellington has just alluded to, when several thousand trees, bushes and plants were put around, with, all within the plastic containers from stopping the munchak and other um, predators. Which now means we have several thousand plastic containers still there. And therefore, I think long term, we have to think it's all very good to put the trees in and everything. But what are we going to do with the equipment that we use to, to protect them or to put those trees in? Mm. Now, somehow, we've got to remove all these several thousand plastic containers, which is going to be fill up several skips. Um, so I think we've got to look, also got to think not only of the now, and we are thinking of the future, but we've got to think of the environmental impact of what we're doing now for the future as well. I don't know if there's any advice that can be given even now or offline, but it would be much appreciated. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know, do you have any comments on either of those two or previous questions, Siobhan? Yes, well, I was... Um... I was going to say, I mean, can I suggest that I take it as an action to uh, speak with colleagues and see if we can get some response from Highways England on these questions of time of year of planting, replacing the trees that have died, and also the, um, the, the plastic um, tree shields, um, both the ones that are existing, but also future plans. Because um, in terms, and, and just further on those plastic shields, it is now possible to purchase um, shields that are not plastic and that biodegrade. Um, and I am almost 100% sure that the ones that we have uh, got from our supplier for our Six Free Trees scheme are, uh, yeah, no, I am sure, um, uh, were biodegradable. So, I mean, that is something that it would be good if Highways England would also do. One more question from... No, it's more of a comment, actually, um, because when I, I worked in that sort of field when I worked in local government many years ago, uh, uh, and one of the experiences that we found, and generally was commented upon, is that the problem with planting these small trees that you're, you're planting on, on these schemes uh, is as much the fact that the trees are dead before you put them in as the fact that, they, that the trees are actually um, uh, the time you put the planting, as long as it's within the winter season. Uh, they basically, you have to keep the roots wet, moist, until the time that you put them in, and often they just take them out and lay them out, and by the time they've actually got in, all the roots have gone. I don't know how easy it is, but I mean, the protection about that is the fact that you have to have effective supervision and replacement of, of dead trees. But, um, so it's... Councillor Bear Park. Yeah, just another comment really. I think um, just in terms of the three free tree scheme, the six free tree scheme, um, because it's done through the parish councils, it's going to be much more effective than a contract from Highways England. <laughs> I've been in several meetings where there's been long discussions, parish council meetings, where there have been long discussions about what type of trees, where they're going to be, and they clearly care very much about you know, the success of these trees. So I think doing it through the parish councils is definitely going to succeed, I hope. <laughs> Hopefully, exactly, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Good point. Okay, so unless you have any further questions, um, perhaps we could um, thank Siobhan for her detailed report. Um, I should also thank um, uh, Peter and um, Eddie for their previous stop modeling report, which I thought was outstanding too. Um, so apologies for that. Um, and perhaps now we could move on to We've got Eleanor Haynes is going to present on the Zero Carbon Communities Programme update. Yes, hi. Um, thank you, Chair. I've got a presentation to share, if that's OK. Um, so I'll just share my screen now. Can everyone see that OK? Okay, so um, I'm going to talk through the Zero Carbon Communities or ZCC programme update, um, which is set out in the attached papers. Um, and the update's intended to provide the committee with information on the progress of the ZCC programme and six free trees um, for comments and questions. First of all, we have the Zero Carbon Communities grant scheme, which is in its third round of funding now. 
So in round one, um, 11 projects are now completed and we have four more projects which have been granted extensions due to COVID or adverse weather conditions, um, but these are still progressing well. Um, and the status of the projects can be seen um, in Appendix A where, they've, uh, where we've assigned a RAG status um, to them. Um, and the success of the grant scheme was um, intended to be indicated by the completion of seven projects. Um, so that we can see that the scheme um, is doing well here. Um, but nevertheless, we still want to get as many um, projects successfully over the line as we can. So um, 17 projects were awarded funding in round two, um, and uh, this distribution was according to the um, categories here. So the most funding was provided for tree planting and then for community building and then cycling. Um, so all projects are underway and are due to be completed by the end of December 2021. Um, and a summary of the projects can be seen in Appendix B. Um, and even in the past few days, we've had a few um, have, have, have had a few more um, updates and further information on projects. Um, so this um, highlights that um, yeah that most of them are progressing well. Um, so 15 applicants in round three have been successful and a total of £98,796 has been awarded um, and a summary of the funded projects can be seen in Appendix C. Uh, we had a series of unusual circumstances which haven't really happened before, um, so where the Tithe Barn Trust rejected a grant of £15,000 um, and we had to withdraw a grant of £4,000 from Foxton Village Hall as the criteria states that the work cannot be done prior to, be, um, to the grant being awarded. Um, and so therefore um, £25,544 remains unallocated. Um, and the options for this remaining funding will be presented to um, the Grants Advisory Committee um, on the 26th of November. Um, so we look forward to working with these projects to, to deliver them um, and hopefully these images that you can see here will turn into the um, real images of the project completion. So as part of um, the project in round two, we also delivered 10 energy surveys of the community buildings through PECT. Um, and we then extended the energy surveys to include 15 more, which are now due to be completed. So the Six Free Trees scheme um, started in 2019-2020 um, as the Three Trees Three Free Trees scheme, um, which it aimed to deliver every parish council in the district uh, with three free trees. Um, so in that year, 54 parish councils accepted the offer, with 162 trees being planted. So this year, the three, Six Free Tree programme has been successful with uh, 72 applications from the parish councils so far, um, and parishes could choose six smaller trees or one large tree. Um, and so far, uh, purchase orders for 186 smaller trees and 22 large trees have been received, um, and they're starting to be delivered and planted, um, which you can see below uh, in, the, in the pictures there. Um, so we've just um, also launched a series of monthly events um, and they're monthly online networking events called uh, the Zero Carbon Communities Green Connect. Um, and these are a series of uh, community networking events um, which include a guest speaker, a short Q&A um, and then a series of breakout sessions where they're encouraged to introduce themselves um, and discuss some set questions. Um, and the next event will be held on the 13th of December on the topic of forest gardening, tree planting and biodiversity in South Cambridgeshire. Um, and this will feature a, to um, a talk on Babram's uh, forest garden project. Um, and so the next edition of the ZCC newsletter is underway and will be published in the first week of December. Um, and also following on from the success of the climate and environment fortnight of events, um, which was held in February 2022, uh, sorry, 2021, um, we plan to hold another one um, in February 2022. Thank you very much, uh, Eleanor. Uh, do we have any questions? Um, Councillor Howell. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, it's, it's with regards to the actual tree planting, um, I've been involved in several parish councils now who would like to take up this particular opportunity. However, they um, might be well funded, but they're not very good with regards to having much land to plant it on. And therefore, it's a small request that when we approach parish councils and ask them, 
we provide them with a small map of whether it's suitable or not is further down the stage um, with regards to what land South Cambridgeshire District Council owns in that particular patch because they might be able to identify a piece of land that we own that they can put the trees on because very many parish councils like one of my own um, has no land whatsoever so they do actively look elsewhere so that is something for a consideration for the future please thank you chairman thank you any other um, questions arising from that um, i just wonder i had one question and um i suppose on the um we've, 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 we've done quite a lot on um uh, e-bikes, I think, with, within a, our three um, successive rounds, um, two of which are underway on ZCC. And I just wondered, do we, um, do we get the feeling that, um, you know, that, that is encouraging people to acquire their own e-bikes and, and use them? Um, do, we, do we need more sort of push on that, do you think? Um, I think it's a, it's definitely um, an interesting thing to to look at. We've received some um, statistics from um, Teversham um, and their e-bike scheme, um, and certainly um, it appeared that it definitely encouraged people to use the e-bikes there. Um, and um, certainly, given the uh, COVID restrictions, um, there was a lot of um, there was I think. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of rides seen um, on the bikes. Um, they have very good statistics around that. Um, and so I think it is definitely encouraging um, people, uh, the uptake of them in bikes. And we're definitely looking at how um, we could, yeah, encourage this further. Um, that's, that's exactly the result that we, we hope for. So that's, um, that's wonderful. So thank you very much for um, your update and report on this. Um, Unless there are any other further questions, um, perhaps we could thank you for your report and move on to um, agenda item nine. Um, and I think would this be for you, Siobhan, to talk about the future um, agenda items for the next meeting, which I think is going to be on the 12th of January, on Wednesday the 12th? Yes, yeah, so I've just shared my screen. I hope, hope that's coming up. What I have on the forward agenda is the biodiversity SPD. The, um, uh, there has been talk of a presentation by Rob Pierce on the Future Parks Accelerator. I don't have confirmation that that is um, wanted on the agenda, but uh, I've got it there as, as certainly a possibility. Um, an update on plans regarding EV charging infrastructure and following Peter Campbell's mention of the housing asset management strategy that perhaps also should be on the agenda for 12th of January. And then moving forward to 7th of March, um, the, we, we have been asked to provide some information on proposals for tree protection in the local plan. Uh, we don't have a tree op officer at the moment, but uh, if we have an, a new one, then that could perhaps come on the 7th of March agenda. And the air quality update, the 7th of March would be a good time for that one. Councillor Bearpark. Um, I just have a question about the air quality update on the 7th of March. Is that, is that a, an update to the air quality strategy that we were presented with a couple of meetings ago? Or is it? That's, that's right, the, is it a strategy? I, I believe okay. so, yes. Okay, thanks. I suppose, um, if, if I may add at some point, um, I think we have... Um, um, we, we should at some point revisit um, green investment. I don't know whether we can make space to discuss that at some point um, in, in the new year. Yes, yeah, so we are expecting the return of our green investments officer in the new year. And actually, I think that hasn't been, as, I mean, it's, it should be a standing item, but uh, that has been a difficulty. But um, uh, I imagine we'll get back as a regular standing item once Alex is back. Yes, I think that would be a, a sort of on, on Alex uh, selling day's return. It would be a sort of, I, I don't think we should um, land her with that on her first day, but um, I'm sure she will be um, 
enthusiastic to, to kind of move things forward um, when, when she gets back. So that will be an interesting topic to, to visit. Um, okay, I just, um, I think we've reached the end of the agenda. I just wanted to say, I think I, I might inadvertently have thanked um, Peter McDonald for the report. Of course, I meant Peter Campbell, so sorry for that. Um, uh, <laughs> my slip, anyway. Um, unless there's anything further, then I think we can draw the meeting to a close. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Chairman, I'm sure you closed out saying we all do wish the Chairman um, um, the very best of health and we hope she's here back soon. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll, we'll uh, make sure that is, uh, unless she's watching it on the public portal, I'm not sure, but uh, um, we'll, we'll make sure that's uh, passed on to her. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, close the meeting.